evening all. I um, hope you can all hear me okay. Um, Damon, are you there too? Good evening, Russ. How awesome. you going, mate? You're right. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, welcome, well, may as well make a start. Um, so, welcome all uh, that have joined us previous weeks and welcome to the newcomers as well. Um, we're in for a real treat tonight, um, and that is uh, uh, Diamond's um, Fiat 500e. Uh, and it is, I've got the privilege of actually driving this car because uh, Diamond lives really close to me, just down the road. And um, it's a super, super impressive uh, vehicle. There's no doubt about it. And I'm sure Diamond's blushing right now if he was so bold to put his camera on but you know we don't need to see that um so without further ado i'll hand over to damon and the first thing to do i think really is to explain i guess really what it is mate because i think um it is quite an extraordinary vehicle that's for sure yes well thanks russ for the introduction um for me fiat 500s have been a way of life for a long time. Um, I started out with Fiat 500s when I was 16, uh, when I lived in New Zealand, and uh, I've owned this one since 1991. Uh, wow. Worked in the motor industry um, since 94, and I worked with Zagami uh, Automotive in Melbourne um, with Fiat and Alpha, uh, which I have worked with those brands for over 25 years now. Um, having said that, I, much as I like modern cars, I like classics and, and I, I'm always interested in the technology behind um, the cars and especially Italian cars for that matter. Mm. And I started to get quite interested in about 2018 in converting a 500 to electric. Um, so, so, so was this, the, would, would, were you focused on a new 500 or like no. a... a Classic. Right. classic I, I, actually, before we go any further as well, I, I, I'm, I know I'm, someone's going to have a go at me over this. So the other thing is, before we get, get started, a bit of housekeeping. Obviously, you're all on mute, first of all. This is the audience. Um, because having 100 people uh, uh, talk all at once would, would be a nightmare. If you've got any questions, if you have a look in, in the bar somewhere, wherever your toolbar is, so to speak, there's a question and answer thing. So you can put your questions in there as we go along. And what I'll do is I'll interject and interrupt Damon as we go along with questions as they're appropriate. And then look, if we do anything we don't cover, we'll, I'll get to at the end of the day as well. And, and Emma's just posted post questions for Damon here, smiley face. So that should come <laughs> up on your screen as well. If you didn't know where you are, that's pointing the way to go. All right, guys. So sorry, Damon. Off you go, mate. Off you go. No, no, that's fine. So, so that's where it sort of started for me in terms of um, the whole journey uh, of going electric. Um, this isn't new. Um, so this particular picture you can see here was one that I took nearly 30 years ago, um, which was an electric Fiat 126, which is the successor to the original 500. And if you have a look in the background, you'll actually see that same yellow car. <clears throat> that I've owned um, that whole time. So this car was obviously older technology with lead acid batteries, but it was something pretty impressive. And uh, I'd sort mm. of never, never really forgotten about it, even though uh, it was a long, long time ago. So, so what is that? Is that in, in, in the UK, in Australia? No, that's or? in New Zealand. New Zealand, okay. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. So there were a few Fiat 500, classic Fiat 500s converted in New Zealand um, to electric and, and that 126 as well. So, um, so that was one I saw a long time ago. That would have been about 1991. That picture was taken. So, yeah. um, so, so yes. So, moving forward, uh, my wife and I did a trip to uh, Europe in 2007 for the 50th anniversary of Fiat 500. And while I was there, I actually saw an electric uh, classic Fiat 500, uh, which had been converted, uh, and we got to drive around the test track. Um, in Turin at the Fiat factory, and uh, I actually got to see this car, and it was it was quite an impressive conversion as well. So, um, but there have been a lot of companies doing conversions uh, on classic Fiat 500s um, in Europe and the UK, and um, Hertz, in fact, hire them in uh, Italy now. You can actually hire a electric converted classic Fiat 500. Nice. Um, so, uh, so this was sort of what got 
me starting to think about uh, going that way. Um, the problem, I guess, is the cost. Um, it's not cheap. Um, so even though it's a small car, um, you still got the motor, the controller, or the batteries, you know, there's a lot of work in it. Um, and you do end up with a car that's still old, um, but, but expensive. And it uh, will lack a lot of the features that modern cars do. Yeah, I, I look, if I can just interject there, we've, we've, I, I think I mentioned this last week, but we're con currently converting a Range Rover to electric and um, it's actually starting with a, with a, 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 a fairly hefty restoration before we can get into it as well. So a lot of times I think with older cars, unless it's absolutely schmick, like, like Tim's Cortina from last week, you're up for a bit of restoration where before you can even think about putting batteries or a motor in it as well. Yeah, and then obviously you've got an older car with, you know, a lot more weight in it as well. So you've got considerations with brakes and suspension and various things. Considering these cars only weighed 500 kilos to start with, mm. you start adding a couple of hundred kilos worth of batteries into it to get some range out of it and uh, you run out of space pretty quickly. So I looked into it and I just wasn't really convinced um, that it was the right way to go. But while I was researching it, I discovered this, which <laughs> is the 500 e so this was released in 2013 um, and it's a variant of the US market Fiat 500. Um, so it was designed for sale only in California. Um, so it's, it's sold only in California and Oregon and it was designed purely for those markets. And so it's, it's not very, very well known. And the reason it's not well known is because it's something called a compliance car. So, a compliance car only exists because manufacturers have to sell a certain proportion of zero emission vehicles in California to sell their petrol and diesel engine vehicles. Mm. So Fiat took over Chrysler um, in 2009 out of bankruptcy after the GFC. And one of the conditions of that was that they were to help Chrysler develop fuel efficient cars. And um, they decided to bring Fiat back to America as part of the way of doing that and uh, they chose to use the Fiat 500 as a basis for their zero emission vehicle. Having said that, very expensive to develop a model specifically for a market. Um, and uh, well, uh, for, for a count, I don't know what kind of is it a county or a region, whatever it is, it's not even for a country, is it, or a market? It's a state. It's, it's, I mean, a state. it's, a big... it's one state, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a big state and a very influential state, but nonetheless, it is a state. Um, and look, you know, that's the reason why Tesla are based in California, because obviously they're very pro EVs, they've got air pollution problems, and um, they have done for many years and been very proactive about solving them. Uh, having not, said that, though, not since Corona, very, that is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. They're very expensive to, to build, and obviously they're a loss leader. And the Fiat 500e gained a fair bit of notoriety in its time because the CEO of Fiat actually said, please don't buy my car. Um, it, it costs me money every time you buy one. Um, and when you see the engineering involved in the car for one specific market in the world, you can you can see why. Um, and uh, that's something that we'll, we'll come to as we go through it. Um, so the car appealed to me because it's got all the modern features in it. It is um, it is a modern car. So it's got cruise control, it's got airbags, it's got stability control, and, and it's it's a car that you can drive every day and use every day. And, and for me, that was something that would make the investment worthwhile. Um, it was a car that was safe that I could drive daily, and <clears throat> it, would, it would make sense um, for me. So I started to look into, okay, how, how, can, we, how can we do this? And, it, uh, it, most electric vehicles that were available on the market, none of them really appealed to me. Um, mm. I, I couldn't see myself driving a, a Leaf or a, or a Kona. Well, the Kona wasn't even out at that stage or the, the Zoe. Um, neither of those cars really appealed to what I liked in a car. Yeah, look, I, I think when you were building this as well, there really <laughs> was only the, the first generation Leaf, if you could get hold of one, because they weren't... Yep. They weren't very few on sale. The Kona and the Ionic ha hadn't been released. The Zoe, right. you, you had to really want a Zoe or really like one. Even then, you, it was difficult to buy one yep. um, for a variety of reasons. Then there was Tesla, and that was kind of it. There wasn't a great deal 
of choice back then. And um, you know, that's right. And also, I didn't necessarily want a big car either. No. Um, so you know, a, a Leaf or you know would really probably be overkill for what I do with the car on a daily basis. So um, so also the other good advantage was it is a four seater as well. So you know, I've got kids and my wife and we can you know we can use the car if we mm. need to um which is also <clears throat> something that we couldn't do with an old old fear 500 so this was something that was quite interesting was something that fiat brought out when they launched the car which shows uh, basically how many miles you can travel on the electricity you use to run your domestic appliances so this shows a range of different domestic appliances and obviously being American, it's in miles, but effectively what they're saying is you can, you can travel for about 16,000 miles, which is about 25,000 Ks on the amount of electricity you would use to run an electric hot water heater. Um, and then it shows other examples of um, the electricity consumption and what that will get you in kilometers, putting it into a car, which is really interesting perspective uh, on an EV. Um, yeah, look, so, a, a similar thing when, when I bought my first Out, uh, Outlander PHEV, I was telling a friend, I can either have a shower or go to work in my Outlander. And, <laughs> and, and, and um, my friend, well, well, can't you do both? I said, yeah, no, I, I do do both. But it's just a, an example of the difference. You know, the, the engine used to have a shower is equivalent of driving, you know, 40 k's round trip, essentially. Exactly. So, so if you have a look, we've got some of the specifications up there. So it's um, 111 horsepower, which is about 85 kilowatts. Um, it's 8.4 seconds to 100, so and that's very achievable. It's, it's yeah. not hard to achieve that, and in fact, that sort of masks the fact that it is actually a lot quicker off the line, uh, as most EVs are and tend to taper off, obviously, as the speed increases. But um, but as I said, it's it's a pretty enjoyable car to drive, um, plenty of power off the line, and um, and a nice size for what I want to do as a commuter, um, which was sort of the main the main thing. So. You can see the subsidised price of the car is about thirty-four thousand US dollars. So, um, so that was basically the recommended price of the car. In California, however, that was subsidised to the tune of about another seven and a half thousand US. So, the car effectively um, cost sort of in the twenties, and then there was there was leasing arrangements that basically meant you could lease the car for three years on a on a pretty nominal rate, sort of you know. One to two hundred dollars a month at some some points on special offers, which made it pretty compelling um, in that market. Yeah, to take it up. So this is a, a bit of a description of how the car was re-engineered. So basically, they got an internal combustion engine Fiat 500 and they re-engineered it as an EV. So you can see the battery packs in there, and we'll we'll come to that a little bit later. Um, uh, you can see, obviously, it's still front-wheel drive, um, and uh, it's got onboard charger. It's heated and cooled battery packs, which we'll, we'll have a look at a little bit later. Um, so this basically just shows how the car was re-engineered um, as an EV. So basically, Fiat partnered with Bosch um, on on the development of this of this car. Nice. So, so this uh, apologies for the slightly fuzzy image, but this this shows what the battery pack looks like inside. So basically, there's uh, 97 cells in there, prismatic cells, um, and that's basically the pack which you'll see later on some pictures of. That's a, a picture of a pack opened up, and beside it you can see the EVC, which basically is what charges it. So it just plugs into a normal 10 amp socket, um, and uh, you can basically just charge it wherever you want to. Have you considered a zappy diamond? Uh, well, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to have a chat about that. Yeah, you know, that was I'll one of the things I was thinking of doing right at the beginning, but I just haven't really found the need to. It's um, the the standard EVC charges it quite happily. Um, and yeah, I just oh, yeah, it comes down to requirements ultimately. It. Yeah, yeah, absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. And, and and all you if you're doing short journeys, then. <laughs> Yeah, sure. You'd be probably as you as you discovered, probably fine with that. So yeah. Well, it's a it's a small pack, and I guess that's the advantage of a small car with a relatively small pack yeah. is that it's it's going to charge overnight anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, in most cases, so this is um, some pictures of the cells. So basically, the Samsung Prismatics. Um, obviously, the energy density is a lot higher now in these cells than it was in 2013 when the model was first released. Um, but nonetheless, it's it's a very nice setup, and um, you can see it's got cooling modules, and so it can heat and cool the battery packs as well to yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, really prolong well the life of them. 
So uh, that was something that also attracted me to the car over some of the other competitors that were around at the time, like a, say an Imeb or a, um, a Leaf, and was the fact that it had the thermal management of the batteries, which was pretty unusual in that time in a car of that size and price range um, to actually have proper thermal management of the packs. And the evidence seems to be that the packs are lasting well and they're not degrading significantly over time, which is uh, which is a good thing. Mm. So, uh, so this is um, how the drivetrain is set up. So obviously you've got the motor, the reduction gear, um, front wheel drive. So it's a single single speed reduction gear. Um, and one of the reasons it's able to have a single speed reduction gear is that it's, the motor will run to 12,800 RPM. So yeah, it's a synchronous motor, but as I said, it has got quite a, quite a high rev range. So it will go up to top speeds, 88 miles an hour. So about, about 145 kilometers an hour. Um, yeah. Okay. And, uh, so as I said, it, it doesn't really need a two speed box, but obviously that's, that is starting to come in as EVs evolve. Um, yeah. So, so just, uh, just a couple of questions actually come in yes. uh, and, and there's a guy here, Tim Harrison, I've seen the name seems to ring a bell. Um, when did they finish making them? Cause this was obviously a compliance car for California. <coughs> You know when they stopped making this? So 2013 until until they when? stopped making all Fiat 500s for US last year. But were they doing electric ones until that point as well? Or yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, look, they're still on Fiat uh, US's website. There's still stock of them uh, available, but they okay. have actually stopped producing them now. Um, yeah. So and, so, okay. Uh, that's that's yeah. interesting. That it would go for so long. You usually they they stop them pretty quick, don't they? So yeah, well, look, Fiat's had a. Fiat changed their direction somewhat, um, and uh, they developed hybrids. Um, there's a Pacific, Chrysler Pacifica hybrid they developed, and they've also bought a lot of emissions credits off Tesla as a cheap and dirty way of doing it, rather than building their own compliance car. Yeah, yeah. I just noticed that in the specs. It's obviously <laughs> it's 24 kilowatt hour battery, obviously, which is great, and then 6.6 .6 kilowatt charging, which is pretty decent. Mm. Um, uh, but I guess it has to have that because there's no DC fast charger on there. And that's a sign of a compliance car as well. I yep. find is that if it's a com compliance car, they don't bother with DC fast charging because that would make it too convenient, right? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, cynic in me is coming out. Um, just one other question before we move on. Uh, gross vehicle mass of the car? Um, about 1,400 1, kilos. So it's about 400 kilos heavier than a standard Fiat 500. Yeah, okay. Yeah, nice. Yep. Yeah, yep. good. So, uh, so... The slight problem with this plan was the fact that we live in Australia um, and it is not easy to do things like this in Australia. Uh, we have a very interesting set of uh, local regulations that effectively try and make it impossible for you to bring something into the country. Mm. So it was not going to be possible for me to bring a car into the country and convert it to right hand drive because obviously being US markets left hand drive only. So I uh, took a leap of faith and uh, purchased a damaged uh, 500E in San Francisco uh, online. It actually took quite a few months to actually find the right car and, and actually buy it at the right price. There was a lot of uh, competition from uh, the Middle East and Europe. Um, probably more than the US in terms of the online buyers. Um, and it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because you can't apply for import approval until you actually own it and then you may or may not get it. Mm. So um, so there are lots of uh, administrative hurdles in terms of trying to do this. Um, but uh, basically it is easier now, which we'll come to a little bit later, but at the time, um, it was effectively impossible to do it any other way. Mm. So that's the car I bought in the US. Um, it, uh, you can see if you have a look, the car had a bit of a, a, a light impact on the left-hand side, quite high up. So the car was still drivable. Um, the radiators, as you can see, are undamaged. So you'll see there are three radiators if you actually look at the front of it. You'll see uh, a lower one, which is um, for the uh, heating and cooling of the battery pack. Uh, then you've got another one for the charger inverter and the aircon condenser in there as well, so electric air conditioning as well. So, um, okay. so that was the car I ended up choosing. So one of the reasons I chose it was the mileage was quite low. It had done 8,000 miles, uh, and I wanted to get a car as recent as possible to get a battery pack that was young in its life. 
um, rather than buy an older one, which I could have done a bit more cheaply. But at the end of the day, in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, the difference of maybe fifteen hundred to two thousand US dollars between buying a two thousand and thirteen and buying a two thousand a late two thousand sixteen, um, I think was worth it. Yeah. So, um, so that was uh, that was why I chose that car and uh, got it to uh, California and then began the process of getting it in to the country. Um, so when I actually looked into it, into the idea of converting it, um, there were a number of challenges. So basically, the first of them is obviously the cost of all the componentry to convert it. So, you know, you need another dashboard, you need another steering rack, you need different headlights, different mirrors, different seats. There's a lot of specific Australian design rule requirements. So. I decided probably the, the best way around it was to actually buy another car, um, which was an Australian compliance car, and effectively retrofit the drivetrain into it. So mm. that way I could come up with a, a legally registered car. So it complied with all, all regulations. So there, there was no issues in terms of legality. Um, and when you actually added up the cost of all the parts on a car like this, it actually wasn't dramatically more expensive to actually just buy another car and, and do it that way as opposed to doing a, a one-off conversion and having to be tied to using a registered automotive workshop <clears throat> that may or may not have been interested and the quality would not necessarily be a given either. So, so essentially, just, just to be clear here, for those that haven't picked up on this, what you embark on it essentially is a reshell. So you've got, a, you've got an Australian <laughs> delivered Fiat 500. Yep. Um, uh, eight, uh, I'm not sure if this is your car or not, but it's so this same. is the actual car. Yep. So okay, basically, okay. yeah. Okay. This was a car that was used by Fiat as a road test car. Uh, okay. So basically, I bought it off the company car fleet once it had done its time, um, and I basically drove it home, and will the, the rest of it will come very shortly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that so, was so, the... so so you've you've done it. Essentially, it's what you embarked on. Is essentially was making one car out of two. Correct. Yep. A, a, a yep. reshell. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, so this was it. So basically I drove it home. So this is what it was. It was 51 kilowatts worth of 1.2 litre um, engine. Uh, nothing particularly sensational, but gets it from A to B. Um, and uh, this was uh, effectively um, the car at the starting point. Then obviously the next stage is to get an engineer involved. So obviously before I spent money in imported cars and did various things, I did a lot of research and looked at the technicalities of what was involved and found a good engineer. So you've got to find the right engineer. You've got to find an engineer, a mass mm. engineer that has EV experience and yeah. is interested in taking on the project because it's not, um, it's, it's going to make it a lot more difficult if they're not really interested in it. So you've got to find somebody who actually really wants to work with you on the yeah. project. And, and, and that's what we found as well <laughs> ourselves is, and I think other, other um, con converters as well, such as, I think Tim will, will say this if you could talk as well, that, that it's really important to find a, someone who's got previous experience and, um, and I like just echo what you're saying as well. Someone's actually interested in it because if they're not interested and not excited about it, they won't have your best interest at heart and won't want necessarily want to see the project finished. It's yeah. awful. It sounds awful to say, but it's but it's true. It's true. But it's it's got to be a consultative process. So you've got to give yeah. them. I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's their reputation they're signing. It's their um, their name to it and it's their livelihood if they get it wrong so yeah and, and you know. look the other thing that point i think i made it like two weeks running now is that you've got to start it starts with engineers doesn't start with the car yeah. and there's engineers that if, if a car's even broadly being touched if it's been pulled apart in any way shape or form then um they won't they won't get involved they won't help you they won't they won't <laughs> they won't help you at all so yeah it's got to, it yeah well, that's right first i mean right. i found the engineer before i even started bringing the car Correct. over from america or anything like that and yeah. and actually discussed the project gave him some documentation showed him what i was planning to do discussed it with him and uh and got him on board first before i even picked up yeah. and then it, it was quite straightforward after that it wasn't a big deal so um so basically the engineer came out had a look at it and said okay well really what we need to do is get the the battery pack and the undersides of the car visible. So this is actually dropping the battery pack out. Yep. Um, so this was the first step. Second step was to get the ICK 
car. So basically to get the fuel tank and strip out the exhaust and everything under the car so we could have a look at the under underside of the structure of, of the cars and see what needed to be done. I just Is that your garage? Is that, is that your garage at home, is it? Yep. Yeah, there's a, I reckon there's quite a few jealous people on the on the, <laughs> on the webinar tonight, mate. I think you'll find, I think you've probably won, I think your audience be pretty upset by now. Um, oh well, yes. Yeah. No, look, it's uh, it used to be my work. It, it's now my hobby. But um, yeah. but as I said, I have restored um, classic cars in there. But as I said, this was um, well. I have done an engine swap previously with an, an Alfa Romeo converted from four to a V6. But as I said, this is probably the most ambitious yeah. engine swap I've done so far. So so I said yeah. So that was the stage. So we basically got both cars stripped out underneath, so the engineer could come along and have a look. So. Once he was happy with that, then started pulling it apart. So that's the original uh, petrol engine coming out of the out of the uh, recipient car, and then this is the um, EV drivetrain, um, basically out of the the EV. Wow. So the major thing is the more care you take disassembling it, the the easier it'll be to reassemble it. So the most important thing is to make sure when you pull something apart that you box it, you label it, you you neatly Mm. work out what bits you're going to use and make it um, as simple as possible to put it back together again and take as many photos as you possibly can because you just never know what you're going to get. No. Uh, and, I, I uh, thought I always thought in, in internal combustion engine cars were simpler than, than electric ones, but that looks way more complicated than... Uh, <laughs> There's the, a lot the, going the, on there. No, no, that, that, that's the EV drive drive. That's, that's the ice one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That looks really simple compared to the other one. It looks the, the, oh, engine, the, the engine. Well, look, yeah, the the ice one's got about six moving parts in it. But um, uh, said it's an eight valve one point two that fit. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Years. but but as said, this is this basically the powertrain you see here. That's the charger, the inverter, the reduction gear, the water pumps, the regenerative braking, uh, everything in that one unit. Uh, yeah, that's okay. even it's even got the electric aircon compressor and everything in that unit. So the major thing is to disassemble it as little as possible, and then it'll make it easier to put it back together again. Yeah, okay. So that's it, uh, basically out. Then basically stripping the two cars uh, side by side. So this was uh, when we got to the second second stage engineering inspection. And you can see the differences in the floor plan here where Fiat's basically re-engineered the floor to fit the battery pack. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the floor with the, the hump in it. And on the internal combustion engine car on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, it's flatter on the edges and there's more of a tunnel in the centre. Mm. So so that was obviously <coughs> the uh, the big changes in the re-engineering to, to convert it to an EV. So this was uh, basically getting the car ready to, uh, to do the modification. So one of the important things, obviously, when you're welding and grinding is not to damage any of the glass. So you'll see the glass is all taped up and there's fire yeah. blankets protecting the sunroof yeah. and the windscreen because the last thing you want is metal embedded in the glass when you come to put that together again. Um, so this was probably the most uh, sort of the point of no return, I guess you could say, uh, when I actually started to cut the floor out of the, the ice car. So you can see that um, <coughs> The, there were lots of spot welds that were, were drilled out uh, and then obviously uh, had to do a lot of very careful measurements and start cutting out uh, the sections would you, of the would, floor. would you like to guess how many spot welds you had to drill out? Oh, uh, well, it was into four figures, I can tell you that much. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. Yeah. There was there was a lot. So, um, so, so yes, yeah, so, that's, uh, so that's basically it with the spare wheel well, the boot floor and the centre um, section removed. Uh, I was going to do a partial boot floor, but I ended up deciding that I'd try and re-engineer it as close as possible to the way the factory did it, which was to do the whole lot. Were, were, so, were you able to were you able to sell the old engine that came out of it? Uh, well, I should get around to this in the corner of the garage. So if anyone needs <laughs> for it, sale or nearest take, offer, the yeah, one point two uh, five hundred engine. The only problem with those is that they're virtually indestructible; um, they just don't break. So it's yeah, really okay. worth it. But, uh, but anyway, we, we move on. So that was it once it was all cut and stripped out. So this is the, the third stage uh, of engineering ins inspection. So basically all the internals of the chassis rails were exposed so we could see what reinforcements were in both cars. This is a huge job, mate. It's <laughs> absolutely huge. This is, this is just, to me, scary as all hell. It's, it's, I mean, incredible. 
I mean, incredible what you've done here. Yeah. So, 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 so I this guess point... once, once you've started, you've got no no point of no return straight away, I guess. Yeah. Well, this point was about three weeks in. Three. It was just under a month in. So we would the the project basically was on a four month timeline, uh, mm. and I did it in in just over three months. So there was a lot of midnight oil burned and uh, everything else, and very patient wife and family while I did this. Um, so did you notice the, did, did you notice the hole in your bank account? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our bank account. Oh, but so, yeah, yeah, uh, course, yeah. So there you go. So so basically that was that was that stage. So we we got to that point. So the engineer came and had another look, and so yeah, this was basically the furthest point where it was stripped as as far as it was possibly going to get. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this was all the donor parts that had to be removed from the EV. So all of those spot welds, you'll see hundreds of holes drilled uh, all around. So all of those had to be very, very carefully drilled out. And so these were all the additional parts of the car that had been changed. So, um, so those were all the bits that had to be obviously moved over to the new one. Um, so You'll see, if you have a look, you'll see reinforcing plates um, in, installed inside the chassis rails there to support the weight of the battery pack with the captive nuts. So everything was done exactly the way the factory did it in terms of the, the re-engineering of the EV um, mm. uh, structure into the car to make sure that it, it complied. Um, so this was a trial fit of the battery pack. So basically, after I cut everything, uh, I put the battery pack back in place to test that everything fitted. Um, which it did, which was good. Um, and then basically I had to put the mounts in the floor. So you'll see that the, <clears throat> the mounts, I had to carefully unpick those out of the donor car and then weld them into the, onto the chassis rails to actually support the pack and make sure it all lined up. So obviously that right. was a, a second test fit after I'd welded it. So obviously I didn't weld it on while I had the battery pack in place, but no. um, that was a, a check afterwards to make sure it all fitted, which was good. And then, it was the case of, again, putting the, you'll see there's an extra cross member that I had to weld in the back there to support the boot floor. The rear beaver panel had to be modified. So so I used a section of the US one and a section of the European one there. Um, this was obviously reinstalling the boot floor. So you'll notice no spare wheel well <coughs> in the US one. So they don't have a spare wheel. So that obviously allows more space underneath for it. So you'll see the, the plug weld. So there were many hundred plug welds, obviously, that uh, were done to actually obviously replicate the factory spot welds. So the engineer was quite happy with that as a as a form of um, of uh, rebuilding the car, um, and he inspected the welds and was happy with the the integrity of them. Um, so that was obviously important that he was on board with that as well. So this is uh, putting the floor back together again. So you'll see if you look on the left hand side, a section of the floor that had to be put back in to let the reinforcements inside, and you'll see that the edges of the panel have got um, a lap joint on them. So everything where, the, where they were joined couldn't be butted. They actually had to be lapped over and plug welded though. That was a condition of the engineer to make sure the integrity of the structure was retained um, as it was rebuilt. Um, so this is putting the center section back in. So you'll see, if you look in the car, you'll see the boot floors in, in now, and then the center section, you'll see all the holes drilled, which obviously had to be welded back up again and this is it once all the cross member and everything was in. So it was quite a quite an effort to make sure everything was correctly aligned and, and put back in the right place. So that obviously the seat belts and everything and the seats would, would bolt into the right places. So um, but everything bolted up and fitted properly which was uh, which was a good thing. Yeah so 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 just in terms of the 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 mounting for the seats and all all was all that exactly the same or did it, was it different uh, with a new car with the, the EV comp compared the, to the, the, the old hard one? points were the same, um, but the way they were achieved was different. So, um, so I had to use basically all the EV hardware um, to to mount them. But it said, yeah, the actual points where they mounted was the same. So, um, so that's it. Once uh, the engineer, so obviously the engineer expected at this point before any any finishing work was done, and um, you'll see the copper primer. Um, to obviously prevent rust between the, the sections as they overlapped. So mm. it's important to make sure when you do this that you do it properly so it doesn't um, deteriorate over time. So I said that was uh, fourth engineering inspection. And then he gave me permission to basically reassemble the car at that point. So, <clears throat> so at that point, I just could go straight for it up until 
it was it was running. So this is uh, obviously sealing all the seams, priming it, preparing it, sound deadening of it. And then this is from underneath. So you'll see the three stages of obviously when it was initially welded, when the seal, seams were all sealed, and then the, the sound deadening and um, uh, body shuts underneath to protect it. That so that's incredible, uh, incredible work. That's all done. And then yeah. painted it um, so it effectively looked factory at the end of it there. So this was when the fun bit begins, which is starting to put it back together. So this is one of the wiring loops. So there were um, basically three three main loops. And this this one uh, basically goes from the number plate lights and the tail lights through to the bottom of the dashboard. So this includes all the aerial wiring, all the tail light wiring, all the um, airbag wiring, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, my son came and had a bit of a look and uh, let me to it. So, um, so then, yeah, so that's that same loop um, as I'm starting to reassemble it in the car. Um, wow. And this is the dashboard loom. So, so basic, sorry, no, this is the, the front body loom. So this is the engine loom, which has both sides of the bulkhead. So if you have a look at here, you'll see how Fiat's actually converted the car to right-hand drive. So it was engineered as left-hand drive car to begin with. But one of the things that made this conversion possible was the fact that you'll see that they've actually left the brake booster on the left-hand side. So you'll see there's a crossover bar there. Um, and it's also electric uh, fly-by-wire throttle, even on the, on the um, internal combustion engine car and the power steering's electric. So <clears throat> there were a lot of things that, you know, I, there was a lot of research that obviously went in before we started the conversion, but all of these things, when I actually looked at them, led me to believe that it was going to be possible. But, so, at the same, but at the same time, presume there were, there were things like, because it was a left-hand drive car, presume things like the instrument binnacle and all that kind of stuff were, they would th th those connectors would terminate on the left hand side than rather than the right hand side though, right? Yeah, correct. So so if you have a look at this picture, you'll see on the on the left hand side, on the passenger side of the vehicle, you'll see a bunch of wires sort of hanging there. So all of those were um, for like the brake light switches, the accelerator, the um, the uh, ignition switch, all of that. So I said that that loom had to be converted over to the to the right hand side. So that was the beginning of it. So I said there were sort of three layers. Um, of conversion of the wiring to, to get it to that point. So this is it again further as the assemblies progressing. Um, so yeah, these these show one of the things that obviously made the conversion possible was the fact that Fiat, when they engineered it, they left the heater box exactly the same left to right hand drive, which is very, very unusual. But they, it was very cleverly engineered so that the heater box was the same. Um, which is important because obviously the electric um, car has an electric heater box, um, so yeah. a, a heating element in it and electric aircon, whereas obviously the internal combustion car has a radiator in there. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see the electric power steering units. Um, so one of the problems I discovered that I hadn't thought about was the fact that they were mirror image of each other. Um, so that potentially could have sunk the project um, had it not been for the fact that they actually did communicate with the digital network, but as said, had that right hand drive power steering system not converted, uh, connected and, and been accepted by the digital network um, for the left hand drive for the, um, for the EV uh, body computer, we would have been in serious trouble. Can you just explain that? I didn't quite understand and probably others don't as well, if that's the case. What, what do you mean by that was going to be a potentially problem? Surely it's just a case of, and I'm not trying to be clever here, um, surely it's just a case of just swapping the steering wheel over, isn't it? Just no, yeah, so if you have a look at the picture, picture on the right-hand side, you'll see how the motors are mirror image of each other. Yeah. Um, so you couldn't mount the left-hand drive uh, power steering um, system on the right-hand side of the car. So if you look at the bottom of the unit, you'll see there's a plug on it because it actually has an ECU in there. So all the stability control systems, the, um, the steering position um, sensors yep. and everything are built into that unit and it's not a serviceable part. So basically you pull that apart, it's dead um, mm. because they're all calibrated and torque set from the factory. So you can't really, you can't really play with them or alter them. So as I said, but, Obviously, the communication to run the stability control systems to obviously to run the electric power steering all has to work off the high speed digital network. <clears throat> and the computers on that network all have to talk to each other. So you mm. have to do what's called a proxy alignment where you actually tell all the computers to talk to each other on the network. Um, mm. So everything works together. So 
sometimes you will find obviously if you've got an incompatible ECU, uh, the whole system won't work. Because mm. if you've got one computer in that network that doesn't talk to the others, the, the network will basically have an error in it. So what you're saying is that the right hand drive steering rack work with the electric vehicle components, is that what you're saying? It's not the rack, it's the actual motor it's assembly, it. the electric power steering yeah, okay. assembly. So um so said that was that was something that I would I sort of had to get about sixty to seventy percent into the project before I found that that was going to be possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was really only at the final stages when I hooked it up whether I found out whether I had a major problem or whether it was all going to be good. And yeah. uh, luckily it was. So oh, beautiful. This was reassembling it all. So obviously putting the dash cross member, putting all the right hand drive componentry back in. And this was the fun bit was converting all the wiring over. So there's three separate digital networks in the car. So they basically, you've got your CAN, CAN bus systems in there. So they control various things. So it's very important, obviously, that you keep the same resistance in the wiring loops because if resistance changes, the, the CAN network will drop out. Um, you've also got to make sure that the, there's no interference created in the system. So there are certain <coughs> sections of wiring that need to be twisted to, to prevent interference. And obviously, when you join it, you have to stagger the joints. You don't end up with, with big, big bunches of, uh, of joints. So effectively, what I did was I got the right-hand drive loom and spliced it into the left-hand drive loom to, to move the component circuit by circuit, wire by wire. Yeah, which, okay. Which was a, a fun job. So this is it once it's all done. So all wrapped up in cloth tape again to make sure that everything's um, how, long take, how long did it take you to swap the, uh, swap the loom over and do all that, all the wiring? <sighs> Look, that was probably a couple of weeks of sort of late nights wow. and, and weekends. Um, yeah, it was probably a week and a half. The, it, it got more complicated. The dashboard loom and the wiring in, in that section wasn't too bad. It was it was more as we got further into it. With so this is the engine bay loom that had to be swapped over. So things like the windscreen wiper motor had to be swapped over to the other side uh, in the wiring. Um, this is reassembling and refitting the drivetrain back into the car, and uh, that was a fun bit when we got to that stage, obviously. And this is sort of basically a, a mechanical test fit. So you can see the battery packs in. Um, you can see the electric air conditioning uh, compressor on the bottom bottom right hand corner, um, the reduction gear, the motor, the drive shafts, everything. So I said that's it's starting to come together again. Um, rear brakes. So all the brakes are upgraded because even though you've got regen braking, the car is about you know nearly 400 kilos heavier. So the brakes, the mechanical brakes, are significantly upgraded as well as the regen. So. Um, it uh, certainly passed the brake test without a problem and just about put the engineer through the windscreen, which was good. Um, so that's as it's going that's together. A, that's how I write my brakes. <laughs> so, um, so yes, he, he didn't have any questions after that. So this is it as a, a, a dummy trial. So basically, once the wiring modifications were done, I basically put all the components back into place. Um, to test it out before I reinstalled the dashboard. So this was it as it was coming back together again. And this was what I call the smoke test. Um, so basically once you've got everything hooked up, you hook the battery up, you cross your fingers and you hope you've done everything correctly and nothing goes bang. Um, so in this particular case, nothing did go bang. Uh, the uh, only thing I had was one extra plug I hadn't plugged in in the bottom of the Master cylinder for the regen braking, but otherwise it was all good. So, um, so that was uh, that was very very reassuring when we got to that point that we knew the project was was going to happen. Did um, Did you make any uh, expletive noises uh, or bad language when you fired it up? Uh, oh no, it was it was it was good. So, and this is just another sort of small thing, but you know, again, something which took several hours, which was you know getting the right hand drive headlights to actually work with the left hand drive wiring because the configuration was completely different. So it's even just little things like that that you forget that that just take time. Um, yeah, yeah. Come to the conversion like this to to get everything to work. Um, this was a putting the charging indicator, so cutting a hole in the top of the dashboard was, uh, was uh, an interesting task, but after all the holes I've cut, it was pretty good by that stage. Um, this was probably the thing that did my head in probably the most in the whole job was converting the door looms over from side to side because they weren't mirror images of each other. So, so basically they, um, uh, like what was a wire on a, on a central locking um, on one side was actually the airbag sensor on the other side. So had I just 
plugged the wires in, there would have uh, been some pretty serious consequences. So again, you've just got to go through every circuit diagram, step by step, wire by wire, and just make sure everything is right um, before you go and plug something in. Mm. Um, this was the door locks. We had a problem with the door locks because the driver's door lock had an extra micro switch to fire up the contactors, which on a right-hand drive car, it didn't have. So I had to basically make a door lock with an extra micro switch in on the right-hand side, which was um, another fun fun job. Um, but we got to a point where obviously starting to reassemble it and it's looking like a car again, which is which is great. Mm. Um, roadworthy and rear gas of the aircon. Um, and we ended up retrimming the car in leather because I had to use the American front seats and the Australian rear seats. So decided to basically just make it all look nice while I was at it. Yeah, no, beautiful. And Vic Roads. Um, so basically, effectively, by the time you've assembled about a 20 millimetre block of paper, um, the rest of it becomes fairly straightforward. Um, so the Vic Roads um, uh, testing was only sort of basically about a 45 minute operation to basically just inspect the car and sign it off and register it as an EV. So, you know, once the engineering's done and everything's sorted and you've got every single piece of paper you need, mm. it's not a big deal. Um, and uh, so, um, basically, was it all worth it? So, yes, in a word, um, it's, it's great. It's a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, I mean, the car's done nearly 36,000 Ks now. Um, and it's a daily driver. I drive it every day. Um, and um, I mean, the picture on the left is at Geelong. So I took it up to the Geelong um, EV group. Great bunch of guys, really, really mm. helpful. So if you're thinking of doing something like this, you know, get in touch with the AEVA, get in touch with Renew, with the EV guys. They're a terrific bunch of guys, really enthusiastic, really happy to help. And Yeah, absolutely. Just, we, we say that every week. We're saying, you, get, you know, <laughs> get in touch, talk to, every, talk to all the experts and all the geeks, and including then anyone on, on AEVA can assist you with this. And um, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, 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 it's the right thing to, it's the right thing for, to do. I think that the most, <laughs> I think what's, what's different to this to the other conversions that i've seen obviously that we've had um on these webinars is it's it's a it's not so much a conversion as a reshell which is just extraordinary it's it's thrown up all those additional kind of um challenges and and um uh that you've had along the along the way so it wasn't mm -hmm. a case of how you're going to make the motor to the the gearbox whatever that was already done by the boffins in fear right it was a case of how are you going to make something that was never designed to have an electric drivetrain in, in it um, as a right yep. wheel drive 500. Well, the, the, the other issue, of course, was that the cars were built in different countries. So the, the, the internal combustion car, the right end drive car was built in Poland and the, the electric one was built in Mexico. So, so there were a lot of differences of componentry and subtle changes because obviously the completely different manufacturing base for them. So funny, I so, just expected an Italian car to be built in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, Funny that, yeah. Eh? Well, neither neither of those were built in Italy, ironically enough. Um, but that particular one was ended up built in Donvale, so it's uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> it's it's very well uh, very well travelled. So yeah, look, it's it's had a lot of interest. It's been a lot of fun. Obviously, took it to the EV Expo um, uh, last year when you could do such things, and um, and it got a lot of interest um, and uh, won a couple of awards for its conversion, which was uh, which was really and, nice and rightly and deservedly so. And um, then one of the things we did was to develop a telematics system for it. So I worked with a guy in Switzerland um, who imports live into Switzerland. And basically, we worked together to develop um, a telematics system that enables us to remotely control the charging, lock and unlock the doors, control the air conditioning from a mobile phone app. So the car actually has one from factory, but it can only be used in North America and only for three years. It's non-renewable. So mm. as soon as you take the car out of North America or the car gets over three years of age, it's no use. So basically, this was uh, developed. I developed this with Jan and uh, Vitterall in uh, Switzerland. Wow. And um, and basically, I now if it's a hot day and my car sitting in the car park, I can just hop on my phone, turn the air con on. So 10 minutes later, when I walk down to the car, it's nice and cold. And um, and also, it's really good when you have the car on charge, for instance, in a public charging situation, you can actually monitor, you know, how much charge it's got, how long it's taking, or if somebody's pulled the plug or they've, the charge has um, dropped out or something like that, you can actually just see it on your mobile, just click in and it, um, it does that, which is, uh, which is a pretty cool 
pretty cool thing and it's now available for anyone who anywhere in the world who wants to, to use it, which is good. That's cool. um, in terms of running costs, uh, basically it costs around about $200 a quarter, which gets me about 6,000 kilometres. So it works out about three cents a kilometre, give or take, uh, to run just on normal domestic supply electricity. So nothing clever. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about roughly um, 25 to 30% of the cost of petrol um, for a similar for, for the same car. I mean, I had an internal combustion one I was using. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but ha but what's the range? It's 24 kilowatt hour battery. So um, what range? It's about you a, well, it's about 160 kilometres is, is the top end. I mean, it's quoted at 84 miles, which is about, uh, what that'll be about, uh, what, it's about 140 kilometres, 130, 140 kilometres. Yeah, about that, yeah. yeah. Um, but it will, it will do 160. Um, I've done it quite quite regularly um so i mean if you have a look that <clears throat> that was one day's driving so basically we did an economy run so you can see um 127 kilometers were traveled on the left hand side um, and it had 30 kilometers range left with 17 percent battery on it um mm. and then later on that day you'll see I've, I've obviously charged it up and and it's almost completely flat so it's, it's seven hours 53 minute charge time which is off a 10 hour plug yeah 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 um, with with 23 kilometre range um, left on it there. So, I mean, I did a, about 250 kilometres in that day, even though the mm. car's only got a range of 160, obviously charged it on, uh, gave it a bit of a top-up charge on, on just with the portable EVC, and then I plugged mm. it into a, um, at a shopping centre along the way and, and went and had some lunch, which was which was good. So, you, you know, with PlugShare, with the apps on your phone, it, it does make it a lot easier to actually plan your routes and, and work around a small smaller range it's not necessarily a problem you've just got no. to got to think about how you're going to do it um, no look, i know no, i totally agree though there's, there's obviously um with a lot of a lot of the, the charges around the, the traps at the moment um it's just a case of planning and, and there's guys that have been doing it tough so to speak in air commerce for for, for for a while now with their with their you know 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leafs, which are closer to 80, uh, closer to 18 or 17 kilowatt hours now because of the de yeah. degradation. Um, so there's a bit of planning required, but for the most part, it, you know, you're able to get around with with that around, you know, around Melbourne with that kind of range quite easily. So, following on from that, Fiat has just announced a successor to the 500e, and it's not a compliance car. So this car is actually a production model. Um, and this car has basically been previewed um, in Milan uh, about six weeks ago, um, 320 kilometer range, um, and it is produced in Italy. So I said, this is the first Fiat 500 that's actually that's produced back in Turin. Um, and it has level two autonomy, it's got fast charging. It's, as you say, it's not a compliance car, it is a properly engineered um, EV platform. So there mm. is no internal combustion engine version of this car. So basically, it is wow. only available as an electric. There is no no petrol, no diesel. So they've gone from one extreme to the other, then, pretty, pretty much. Yep. Correct. So they've gone they're, from they're, hey, here's here's the battery, battery car if you want it, but don't buy it. To we're going all in, and and we don't do a petrol version at all anymore. Exactly. Yep, that's what Fiat's saying. All in. Exactly is what they're saying. So they're basically, if you want one of these, you buy the EV, and that's it. So, um, so that's that's the only way. So, yeah, it's 320k range um, WLTP, which means, yep. you know, it could be closer to probably 400k's as around town. Um, yeah. So, so the uh, Daniel good. just asked a question. He said, "Oh, I'll be getting this here." It is available in right-hand drive, so UK is taking it. Um, yep. So, it is potentially possible, but at this point in time, look, it's it's probably between 55 and 65 thousand dollars. Uh, is probably what it'll cost by the time it gets here. Uh, and it's a question of whether there's a business case big enough to support it. Um, so at this stage, there, we have been taking some expressions of interest now, but it's not confirmed for us. So is Zagami, like, I mean, they're a fee dealer, are they? As well? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so obviously, uh, if it's something you're interested in, by all means, um, drop me a line and I said, I'll... But I'm, it, I'm happy to uh, to keep yeah. you posted on developments, but look, if it happens, it's not going to happen probably for closer to 12 months in the current world climate. But um, but as said, that is the successor to to my car, and um, and a pretty cute little thing. Nice one it's that. very attractive. So um, so yeah, I think that pretty well rounds it out. 
Um, that's, would you that's like awesome. me to run through some? Uh, yeah, let's let's go let's go through the questions. Uh, <laughs> so let's go 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 from the top. Some of the answers that we go have gone along. Um, so obviously Monty's asked about importing, and I think that says RMS requirements. I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, and how to go about it point by point. I, I think you kind of covered that off pretty much. I know I've gone through something similar myself. I, I guess the, I, I used to, I, I imported a couple of BMWs back in the day, a while back, and they were all sorts of conditions associated with them. But I think with your, with that particular car, did you import it as a car? Did you import it essentially as parts? I think that that's probably the best thing. To yeah, ask yeah. basically it, it, it was done under a dispensation through, through Canberra. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, but it said, yes, it, it, it can it can happen under a ministerial dispensation. Having said that, now under the new SEVS rules, uh, it's a lot easier for EVs. So they have actually put provisions in under the new SEVS rules to allow EVs to come in with a lot less restriction. So if you were going to go down that path now, mm. you could probably just apply to have it on SEVS. Um, the challenge is obviously you would have to get a registered automotive workshop to do the conversion. So you wouldn't necessarily have to go to the extremes that I did. Mm. Um, you could just do a proper a right hand drive conversion, convert the wiring, convert the steering, convert everything over. Um, so I said, there's nothing stopping anyone from buying one in the US um, going down the path, but as a one off, it's going to be expensive. Um, to, and you're going to have to find a registered automotive workshop that's prepared to take it on. Uh, look, um, we work with imported all the time um, ourselves because we, we're um, the preferred supplier for a lot of um, components and, and conversion parts for the Nissan Leafs. I don't know if anyone knows that. So we regularly convert the head units and the instrument binnacles to to English. Um, so if anyone's interested in a bit of help or some contacts regard that, then, then give us a bell and we'll put you in touch with the right people, um, the right importers who are EV savvy and and focused and obviously interested in this stuff as well. Um, happy to help in that regard too. Um, tear weight, gross volume, vehicle mass. I think we answered that 1400 kilos or 1500 yep. kilos thereabouts. Yep. Yeah, just uh, yeah, and the liquid cooled cells, yeah? Correct. Yep. Yeah, yeah so liquid, they're heated and cooled. So there's a heat exchanger off the aircon. So yep. it, it can cool them and it can heat them as well if it needs yep. to. Yeah, yeah, so, that's really advanced for the time. That's, that's really impressive. Um, and then um, Ali is answering: Is it easy to convert electric five hundred to right-hand drive? Well, yes. And as I said, with the current legislation, yes, it, it would it would be possible to do it. Um, but as I said, if you weren't going to invest the sweat equity I did in my conversion, uh, you could if you could get one in under the new SEVs rules. Yes, you could potentially convert it to right hand drive. Yeah. Um, and you could do it cheaper by using an older car because obviously Fair 500 has been around for nearly 10 years now. Yeah. So you could, you could find it. The trick is to find the right donor car because there are three different ratios of steering racks, for instance. There are all sorts of things that, you know, there was a lot of technical research went into doing this before I actually went ahead and did it. Um, so there are things that will catch you out if you don't do the appropriate research to start it. But yes, it is definitely possible, and you could do it by simply boring you, you can one do hole it through now, the floor rather than cutting the whole floor out. Yeah. So, so I think you, I think the, the answer to the question is you could do it now, but you probably couldn't have done it when you were when you. It was impossible work. to do it when I did it. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 But as I said, it may be possible now. I don't think the states really know how to interpret the new SEVs rules. And if you want to be in a guinea pig to, to try it out and go down that path, we'll get um, popcorn. Do, you, do your research, as Russ says, talk to the right importers. Um, and, uh, and you know, you can go through, through the procedures from, from there. Uh, obviously, the US dollar is not too, uh, not the Australian correct. dollar, US dollar rates not too flash at the moment. So there no. will be some obstacles. Popcorn. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, I think I know the answer to this, this question from Greg Flynn, which is, did you manage to actually ask, ask any questions of the Fiat factory? Uh, I think for support, for example, were there, were there anyone, were there anyone that confirmed left hand, left hand drive steering point would be okay for right hand drive use? So did you get um, any support from me? Because obviously you, you've got some, you've got some, you're in the trade, right? You're in the, the motor trade. Oh, look, so. I've, I've, look, I've worked with the Italian cars for the last, 25 plus years um, and I do work for a Fiat dealer 
um, but nobody knew um, because the uh, US market car was made by a Chrysler factory in um, in Mexico, yeah. and the European one was built in Poland. Nothing crossed over, so not even a single part number was the same, even though the part. I think that's a scary thing with these kind of projects. You, you, you're asking your questions and then asking questions about these, you know, the subject matter. And then, then you realize you're the expert. Yeah. Look, nobody knew. Um, yeah. I did, I did a lot of, um, don't get me wrong. I got some technical assistance out of, uh, FCA, um, mm -hmm. in terms of getting hold of the workshop manuals and working out what diagnostic computers were going to work with it. Um, and various other things like that because it's it's actually not an OBD port because it's not required to run OBD because it doesn't have any emissions. Yeah. Um, okay. So there were there were various. I mean, it's um, there were there were things that I was able to get a sixty to seventy percent answer on. Um, yeah. And then I just had to take a leap of faith that it was going to work out from there. Yeah. 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 You uh, look. It's um look. Uh, uh, I can echo that because you know, with the with the Audi, the, the first guy car I converted the Audi, it was a case of I'm starting, but um, I, I really hope that I finish, <laughs> you know, um, because you just you, you there's a whole lot of unknowns, and you enjoy doing it because of the challenge along the way, and that's what we live for sometimes. We, we don't want it to be easy, um, but you yeah, just, that's exactly you, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you don't. There's no out there, there, like you said with the steering box. You didn't know if you had an answer to that or if it was even resolvable until you actually had the thing in front of you, you could plug it in and work out what, if it was going to work or not. There's nothing, there's no manuals that would tell you that. Right. So. No, that's right. Until, until I actually put it on the area network, did the, did the synchronization of the computers on the network um, and, and tested it. There was no mm. way of knowing. Nobody could tell me. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but as I said, fortunately they, they, in whatever way, but despite the fact it was a complete mirror image, um, it was worked on the same protocol, the same yeah. uh, connectivity, and it worked, which was, mm. was made life. I, I've, I've got a I've got a question for you. So as well, did you enjoy do you enjoy driving it more than you did do converting it? Um, that's that's an interesting one. Um, because I reckon you missed it. I think people missed the once you got convert the product, you'd got it done. Then you know there's We'll put it this way: There's not a day I don't look forward to driving it. Um, you know, it's it just makes it so much more enjoyable. I mean, not that we've got a lot of traffic in Melbourne at the moment, but no. but for the heavy, heavy commuting that I do through traffic from the eastern suburbs into into Richmond every day, it just makes it so much more enjoyable. Um, you've got no stop start, you've got no gear changes, you've got no vibration, no noise. It's just it's just so much more enjoyable to drive in what is normally a tedious task of commuting mm. um, and obviously having small size and extremely good acceleration off the line. It just, you know, just gives you a lot more confidence in terms of merging in and out of traffic and getting in and on out of the freeway. And, you know, you see a small gap, you can hop into it and it's, yeah. it's just, it's just the perfect tool for the, for what I want to do with it. And, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, and, and that is actually exactly, I think what I've said a couple of times now is that, you know, you need to, convert the car that you actually want to drive rather than you know the car that's the first car that you see on facebook marketplace or what have you yeah um, i mean i think a lot of people get hung up on range anxiety thinking yeah. they need a lot more than they do um you know look at what you need to do 80 to 90 percent of the time mm. and say well is this going to do it and i mean in my case i've got 100 kilometers extra range mm. over and above what i do on a daily basis is, I, 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 just to say as well, I, obviously I, I've, I've, I've not seen the car in the flesh. I've actually driven it. It is genuinely beautiful. It is just that the pictures don't do it justice. It's a lovely, lovely color as well. And it's just an absolute, you know, gorgeous conversion um, that you've done there. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, just a couple more questions here. Yep. It's, um, so what was your total cost? Less your labor, including the donor vehicle. Uh, I've answered your wife, your wife's actually on here as well. I've told her that it only costs five dollars. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so but feel free to answer or not. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, I mean, in terms of the the cost of importing the car, the customs, the obviously the importation, the engineering, all the rest of it. Um, look, all in all, it works out about thirty five 
thousand Australian dollars. Yeah. Um, with yeah. a lot of sweat equity in there. So, I mean, if you had to pay for another sort of 500 or 800 hours on top of that, um, obviously it would not look like a particularly financially sensible no. proposition. But, no. No. but as I said, uh, with a lot of uh, free labour, it, uh, it kind of gave me something that I like a lot without um, spending, you know, an obscene amount of money on it. Yeah, that's right. Um, people spend a hell of a lot more of that than on a obviously on on Tesla's and all that kind of stuff anyway, and don't get well, the. My um, calculations were it would pay pay itself back in four years. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, probably absolutely. around three three and a half to four years. Yeah. Basically, it's paid for itself, and then anything else you get above that's a bonus. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to complete once you had both cars in front of you, as well? It was about three and a half months. So it, we set a four month deadline because the engineer was going to be retiring. Um, yep. So I think I know who of, he was as well. A lot of room for error. Um, and uh, I persuaded him to take it on based on the fact that it was going to be done by Christmas um, yep. 2018. Yep. And I said, yeah, we managed to do it with a month to spare, which was, which was good. That's pretty impressive, actually, given the amount of work, the amount of hours it got into, <laughs> obviously pretty dedicated to get through it. Um, in that amount of time, that's that's actually, actually pretty. With all the challenges he had along the way as well, it's pretty. Yeah. that's pretty good. That's pretty. Well, good. yeah, the car was the donor car was impounded in in customs uh, out of the US, and there's all sorts of interesting other things that happened, which uh, made the project sort of quite a rush at the end of it all. Yeah, but, okay. uh, but it all came together, and uh, and certainly, uh, as I said, yes, it was done done on time, and it's been extremely reliable. It's really caused no problems at all. I mean, servicing's really just rotate the tyres and top up with mm. screen washers and I oh, might get pulling a pollen filter in next time. That's about that's about the size of it, which is fantastic. Um, Jeff Williams has, has asked the question, what's your next project? <laughs> I would imagine you're done for now. Is that about right? Or is there something that he knows we don't? I don't. Um, no, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it, really. Um, I mean, it was a technical exercise to learn about EVs and the technology. And, and from that perspective, it did its task for me and, and I'm just enjoying it now. So, so from that perspective, yes, I mean, the next, next project is a 1969 Alpha GDV, but, um, that's keeping twin carburetors and, uh, and, uh, an engine um so uh so yes uh at this point in time no i'm just happy it's it's everything i want and yeah um, and it's and it does the job for me um, that's that's perfect excellent all right um i think we're out of questions and pretty much out of time as well so um thank you for that time i really appreciate your your time and your contribution um hope everyone else has enjoyed that as well um i know i know i have um uh if you've got any additional questions, then obviously fire them um, at uh, our Facebook, um, else uh, our, our email address or Emma even. Um, and um, yeah, and we'll do our very best to, to answer those for you and, and, and pass you on to Damon as well. The other thing is we've got another one next, we've got another one next week, same time. And this is a beauty actually, this is a, what's called a Bortana EV. It's a heavy duty corrosion proof mining vehicle. And um, it's just, it, it's an amazing thing. Um, like nothing I've seen previously. Um, think or, think um, that Toyota um, Hilux on steroids. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty awesome vehicle. So um, I, I would highly recommend you make time for that next week as well and, and join us all over again. Um, thank you again, Damien. Thank you for everyone for joining us. Thanks for the awesome questions again. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, and uh, we'll see you all again shortly. Excellent. Good night. Cheers, Damon. Thanks, yeah. buddy. All the best. Yeah. Bye. Bye.